permaculture versus science, organics versus synthetics, heirlooms versus hybrids. Hi, I'm some guy with a garden, and today I want to talk about this great debate between the permaculture world and conventional gardening. Last week on NPR's Science Friday, a show I love, by the way, they had a segment on gardening. And being science, they were talking with scientific gardening type people, and they pissed me right off. Now, was that because they were debunking all of my permaculture myths? No, it's because they were being downright anti-science. And this gives us a really good opportunity to talk about one of the differences between the permaculture approach to gardening and what you might learn in a master gardener type program uh, through a university extension because they're actually quite different in terms of the way they're, they're, they're taught and the way they approach gardening. For example, there were several statements of these self-proclaimed scientific gardening experts that are actually strongly contradicted by reason and by good peer-reviewed scientific research published in peer-reviewed journals by scientists. And some of these are just very common beliefs of people who consider themselves to be the scientific gardening community. And there was one in particular that really cuts right to the difference between permaculture and conventional approaches to gardening. And that is this question on when it comes to the gardener, the gardener's perspective, to the gardener, is there a difference between organics and synthetics? Which gets to the point, is there a difference between organic and conventional? And the statement is really interesting because it gets to uh, the heart of the matter. Because these are the very products, the poisons and fertilizers, they're the very products of the scientific horticulture and agriculture community. Which really brings us to the core of the problem, which isn't science at all. Science is awesome. It, the problem is the conflict of interest created by governments. And by the way, this was all opposed by actual scientists when the governments were implementing these things. But it's this conflict of interest in this sort of university industrial science complex and the products that they market. So now, but first, before we get into that, uh, <laughs> I want to say that permaculture isn't anti-science. The best permaculture is actually rooted in good scientific research. But the best permaculture aims to actually transcend some of the limits of modern science and, and its institutions. Uh, for example, these conflicts of interest that we'll be taking a look at and uh, some of the other limits of, of a rational worldview. Now, we're not rejecting science, but we're looking to see how, in some ways, we can transcend some of its limits and integrate the best science into what we're doing while still meeting more holistic goals that we might have. So let's get to the question that was asked on Science Friday. To the gardener's perspective, is there a difference between organic and synthetic fertilizers? Now, the Science Friday guest gave the standard uh, kind of political answer of horti uh, scientific horticulture, the people who consider themselves scientific horticulturists. And that answer is no. There's no difference as far as the plants are concerned. The difference between organic and synthetics is that synthetics are synthesized by us and organics come from natural sources. That's the only difference. The uh, guest went on to say that to plants, it doesn't matter. All they care about is getting the right nutrients and the right ratios and uh, when they're getting them. That's what the plants care about, he said. And then he ended the answer right there. Now, in a way, he's not wrong, but this is why permaculture is different. Permaculture looks beyond that oversimplified answer and considers our deeper goals, our deeper uh, values, and what we really want to accomplish and why. It starts from the perspective of the gardener and that the gardener may want to care for the earth, care for people, and make sure that there are enough resources for all of us to thrive. 
For example, the Garner may very well care that there's abundant peer-reviewed research that shows that synthetic fertilizers, when compared with organics, actually increase pest pressures and the numbers of herbivore pests in the garden. Synthetic, you use synthetic fertilizers, you're going to have more pests. Now, if you're interested in that, SARE.org has a great rundown on some of this research. There's also a 2012 meta-analysis by Butler, Garrett, and Leather uh, showing the same thing, finding that the research generally uh, you know, agrees with the common consensus that synthetic pesticides or synthetic fertilizers cause more pests. By the way, Butler, Garrett, and Leather sounds like a name for a hipster deodorant. Butler, Garrett, and old leather smell like you work for a living without having to work for it. Now, to my reading, this really isn't disputed at all by the scientific horticulture community. In fact, it's very robust and well accepted. Uh, but to the scientific horticulturists, this is no problem at all. In fact, it's simply an opportunity to sell more of the university industrial complex's fine uh, biocides, pesticides, and herbicides. More pests, more pesticide sales. And in the end, as far as they're concerned, you probably get an overall higher yield anyway, so what's the big deal? Scientific horticulture community is so indoctrinated into this way of thinking that, uh, that the MSU Master Gardener, what they call their Smart Gardening Program, it's smart, uh, says that you cannot grow. Their page for home uh, fruit production says that growing fruit requires a spray schedule. You cannot grow fruit with, uh, at home in Michigan without spraying. But the permaculturist, on the other hand, considers that the gardener may have very good, very rational, very evidence-based reasons for not wanting to spray poisons all around their yards and on their food and where their children play and bare feet. Earth-conscious gardeners may also understand that these synthetic fertilizers uh, require large amounts of energy to produce, mostly from fossil fuels, and they might actually care about using finite resources in their gardens, resources that are associated with climate change, with uh, resource conflicts, and wars like the one that's going on right now in Ukraine. And they may wish to avoid supporting the corporations that profit off of, off of all those systems. Corporations which are associated with climate change, climate denial, and in a lot of cases, uh, promoting social injustice all around the world. They may want to avoid supporting uh, an industry that a vast amount of research all concludes is the number one cause of climate change, a major driver of mass extinctions, of ocean dead zones, of water pollution, of uh, cats and dogs living together. You know, bad stuff. So the best permaculture then looks at the scientific evidence, the best evidence that we have around on patterns that can help us provide alternatives to the plastics, poisons, and petroleum paradigm. That's a whole lot of peas. P, that's one good alternative. For example, despite what the scientific horticulturists say, it's perfectly possible to grow a ton of fruit in Michigan without spraying and in other places with high pest pressures. Now, but I do want to be clear, they do make a really good point. You can't just grow a bunch of grocery store uh, hybrid varieties of fruits and vegetables and expect them to do well without uh, pesticides and without a spray schedule. They're absolutely right about that. But the permaculture approach is to use good crop selection, selecting uh, crops that are known in the area to uh, have lower pest pressures and to avoid pest problems so much and to use other techniques like maybe bagging fruit and using overall system design so that we're relying on what ecologists call the uh, brain fart, the diversity resiliency principle, which says that the higher number of organisms there are in an ecosystem, the greater resilience to pest and disease and other pressures it confers to the individuals in the system. So we're using high 
biodiversity, healthy ecosystems to keep pest damage down to a, a, a level where it meets our needs. We're still harvesting lots of clean, beautiful fruit and we don't have to eat poison and spray it all around our yard. These silly... Uh, These silly superstitious gardeners may care that there's actually a ton of peer-reviewed robust scientific research from ecologists showing that pesticide applications really are incredibly damaging to insect biodiversity. They might care that scientists worldwide are telling us that we should be very concerned about plummeting insect levels and that that increases uh, damage to ecosystems all up and down the trophic chain because insects are at the base level there and birds feed on them and voles feed on them and uh, other animals. Just takes the right plan the right crops, the right design, and good, healthy ecosystems and soil, and we can grow gardens just fine without these synthetic products. And the same thing applies to several of the, the other statements that they made on the Science Friday broadcast. Another one was about, is there a difference in terms of the environmental impact of hybrid uh, plants and heirloom plants? And again, the NPR guests gave the standard university horticulture, scientific horticulture uh, uh, answer, which is no, there is no difference in terms of the uh, environmental impact, period, done, end of statement, move on to the next question, please. And yes, it's entirely possible to create uh, studies where we test uh, hybrids versus a random selection of heirlooms and find that there's no difference in terms of the uh, impact at all. In fact, imagine for a second that you are a graduate of university horticulture uh, program and you're looking for a smart way to invest your time, your resources, and your money. So if you were to start a seed company selling uh, heirlooms, you would have to compete with everyone else selling heirlooms because heirlooms are plants that have been cultivated over a long period of time. Usually the cutoff is around 50 years. At least some of them are way older than that. And they have heritages that go back hundreds or even thousands of years and of cultivation. And, uh, and so they're, you can save the seeds from them very easily. So uh, for one, anybody else who wants to sell those, you're competing with them. And your customers can just decide to sell their own seeds and they're no longer your customers. And that sounds like a bummer. But if you uh, invest your time in creating a hybrid instead, then those uh, hybrids you can't save the seeds for. So one, you are now the only source for those seeds and you can usually sell a markup. Now, uh, the way I would do that and create that is you start taking, you look for, uh, is, let's say I wanted to develop a hybrid uh, with good verticillium resistance. So I would look for heirlooms that are known to have adapt those, those uh, uh, qualities and I'd breed them together until I find one that is extremely resilient to, uh, to verticillium. Uh, so now I can easily create a test where I take my verticillium resistant crop and compare it to a bunch of other crops and subject it specifically to ver verticillium and show that it has greater disease resistance than, you know, whatever heirlooms I just randomly selected. But at the same time, those other heirlooms would have built-in resistance to a bunch of different diseases and uh, different conditions that are local conditions, things like drought tolerance and whatever your local conditions are. And the hybrid probably is not going to have those. It's just going to be really good at verticillium. So, but in a test where you're feeding them uh, nitrogen and spraying them with pesticides and herbicides to keep them healthy, it may outperform those others when subjected to verticillium. And a lot of the research comparing hybrids and heirlooms is actually exactly like this. But keep in mind, for the most part, those resistances came from plants from natural populations or 
from heirlooms in the first place. Though the heirlooms probably have much higher resilience to a bunch of diseases in your local area. So this is theoretical, but there's a ton of research that actually backs this up too. Uh, in fact, there's a study on wheat in Iran and it found that the, the, the local Iranian heirlooms, the, they're often called landrises there, uh, significantly outperformed the imported varieties of wheat because of their local evolved resilience to things. So this has good science too. And in fact, there's a bunch of studies that show uh, that uh, researchers are actually scientists. Scientists are actually very concerned about the loss of heirlooms because of the pressures uh, of having to compete with hybrids. Because if we lose the heirlooms, we lose all this genetic capacity, the evolved genetic resistances to a bunch of diseases and things. So a gardener may just want to support uh, continuing the, to, to preserve that genetic diversity of the heirlooms. That's a perfectly reasonable and scientific way of, uh, of thinking about things. And if we are uh, growing crops that have less damage to a variety of pests and diseases, we'll require fewer synthetic fertilizers, fewer um, uh, pes uh, pesticides and herbicides, which are damaging to the environment. So overall, it's really hard to conclude in any reasonable sort of way that the ecological footprint and the environmental footprint of heirlooms and hybrids is the same. It's in most cases, the heirlooms are going to be better if we keep them. Local heirlooms are going to be better for the environment and there's a real need to preserve them for the environment. So this is why we need permaculture. One, to provide alternatives and a critique of that university industrial complex and its products, its way of growing things. You know, the whole paradigm is actually one that's all about consumerism and products. Gardening from that perspective isn't something you do or something you co-evolve with your ecosystem. It's a product, a set of products that you buy from the university industrial complex and its fine graduates. Gardeners need permaculture if they want to design gardens that don't require plastics, petroleum, and poisons. And if they want to grow uh, uh, gardens that are resilient and uh, uh, have food sovereignty independent of this global corporate system that a lot of us oppose on environmental and ethical grounds. And finally, while the best permaculture uses the work of scientists to figure out how we actually do that job, permaculture can transcend the limits of this scientific perspective. For example, permaculturists can recognize that there's actually a lot of good research in sociology uh, that shows that a spiritual, uh, spiritually fulfilled life can confer health benefits and mental health benefits and increase our happiness. There's a, that's actually science. That's not anti-science. The only problem is if people want to take that those beliefs then and try to impose them on other people. You know? Permaculture can recognize that there's a place for a spirit in the landscape. A lot of us who do gardening do it to connect better with nature and community and with this whole spiritual side of life that's there just beneath the soil, just right there in the garden waiting for us to touch it. And that that is a completely valid choice for us to make. That's not woo, that's not superstition, that's completely valid. So permaculture can take the best of science and use that to make our decisions and it can still leave room for us to make some choices that are simply about having beauty in the landscape and having spiritual fulfillment in the landscape. And it doesn't reject that it transcends and embraces both. It doesn't reject science and go backwards to a pre-rational worldview. It embraces both science, but then reintegrates our intuition and our heart and our spiritual sides. Good permaculture can help us make the best choices to meet our own personal goals and our values in the garden, the landscape, and beyond. And it can help us connect spiritually and emotionally with the work that we do to build a more just and sustainable world. Okay, 
Well, that's all I've got. Back to the gardening for me. And you have a wonderful day. Thanks for watching.